created to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. We were created. See, we were created to make a difference. We were created to serve God with our life. But I want to tell you this morning, you will never, ever reach your fullest potential. You will never live the life that you were fully created to live if you're not living for the right vision. If you're not living for the God vision for your life, for the God purpose for your life, you will forfeit the life that God has called you to live. How are we supposed to know how to live if we're not following the one who created us? We think, we think that we can just go about our lives and live the way that we want to live without consulting the one who made us. But the one who made us is the one who uniquely and intimately crafted us the very way he needed us to be crafted. He gave us the gifts and abilities that he needed us to have to do what he called us to do. He gave us the insight. He, he let us be born in the place we were born. He let us have the things that we have so that it would engraft in us the way we need to live our life to fulfill what he's called us to live. But how are we going to do that if we don't consult the maker? We can't. But we try to live that way. And today, I really want to tell you and I want to inspire you to, to drop any vision that isn't the God vision for your life. We all have a vision for our life. Whether we think so or not, we all have a picture of our preferred future. That's what a vision is. It's a picture. It's a snapshot of the future. And we all have visions of our future. But my question is, are you following a God vision for your life? Or are you following a self vision for your life? What vision do you see? When you snapshot out two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years down the road, whose vision are you serving? Whose vision are you serving? Are you serving your vision? Are you serving just the American dream because that's the vision you've been given? Or are you serving the God vision over your life? And maybe you don't know the God vision for your life yet. And I pray that even now as I speak today, God would breathe a God vision into your life. And it would radically alter the destiny of your life. That you were going one way, down one path, for one vision. But today, in a moment, God could breathe a God vision into your life that totally changes your direction. That you begin living for a future bigger than yourself, a cause bigger than yourself, a cause to see people come to Christ, to rescue those who are in unjust situations. Check out this quote. I love this quote from a book. It says, we cannot pretend that we can see things perfectly from God's perspective, but we can plead with him to give us a glimpse of the world from a loftier vantage point. Few of us are tempted today to dream too big. Isn't that true? Rather, our vision shrinks to the size of our limited experience. Yet all things are possible, say all things, are possible for those who believe in the God who created the heavens and earth. In our disbelief, we can ask God for inspiration to believe. Then he may give us a vision of divine size. Church, that's what I want for every single one of you, is that you walk out of here with a vision of divine size, that you lay down small visions, you lay down petty visions, you lay down selfish visions, and you pick up a God vision for your life. If you want a title for the message, it's pick up the God vision for your life. See, the visions is like a target. And, and every target has a center. And then there's usually, you know, it's like the yellow and then there's the red and the blue or something like that for an arrow target. And I want to tell you, there's, there's targets all over. There are visions for our life that we see. And, and many of the ones that are closest to us, they're easiest to hit and they're the ones we go after. And they're the ones where the middle of it has us at the center. If you looked at the target, it would say your name on the middle. And, and if you're honest, you've been serving that vision for most of your life. And, and maybe, maybe you've grown a little bit, and maybe it's, yeah, you at the middle, but maybe others are on the next side out. And then maybe you've started coming to church, so then maybe God's on the outside. And so you think, oh, I'm, I'm serving God. But if you were really honest with yourself, what, what the vision you're actually shooting at has you in the center. It's all, about, it's all about you. It's all about your school and 
It's all about your career. It's all about your finances and where you're going to live and what house you're going to have and what car you're going to drive. It's all about your bank account and your hobbies and what you want to do. And I'm not saying those things are bad, but I am saying if that's the center point of your life, you are missing out on the great adventure that God has for you. You're missing out on what the creator created you to do. Because if we shoot for the targets with us at the center, I want to tell you it is easy. They're the ones that are closest. They're the easiest targets to hit, and so those are the ones we shoot at. But I want to tell you, why do you think people hit a midlife crisis? Because they've been shooting for a vision that's all about them. And then when they think they got there, they realize there's absolutely no fulfillment in that. There's no fulfillment in serving yourself. See, there's an American dream that says if you get all that you wanted, you'll be happy. If you get the cars, if you get the girls, if you get the guys, if you get the place, if you get the job, if you get the career, you'll be happy. But how many people do we see in life who've risen to the tops of world success, who have had the money, they've had the houses, they've had the cars, and they were utterly miserable in, they li in their life? Just recently, there's Hollywood actors who literally overdosed on drugs. Their life becomes so depressing, they start taking so many drugs to dull the pain because the vision they thought was going to bring them everything brought them to nothing. In church today, I'm not so much going through a verse by verse, but I just want to share my heart for you. I want to share my heart for your life. Because I honestly think it would be a tragedy, an absolute tragedy, if you lived your life and never found out what God created you to do. If you lived your life for yourself, what you thought was going to bring you fulfillment, but at the end of the day when you died and you stood before God and you looked back over your life, God would say, you missed out. You missed out on what I called you to do. You missed out because all you had in your sight was yourself. You see, there's other visions you can serve in your life besides you. But they are farther out. If, and maybe you're a good person and maybe you have others at the center. And it's a little farther out. The target's farther out, and maybe others are at the center. There's some good people who aren't Christians. There's some great people that don't know God, but they do good things. But uh, maybe others are at the center, and then you are kind of on the outside, and then it's God. But that'll bring you to the same place. I want to tell you, church, the only vision that's going to bring you ultimate fulfillment in your life, that you're going to find the grace zone. You're going to find the place that you are just thriving in life because you're doing what the creator created you to do. Is that target that's so far off, it's honestly hard to see. That it almost seems impossible. It's so far out and it has God at the center. And it has others outside it and it has you at the end. See, what I love a story and I, I wasn't planning to share this, but I love the story about when Jesus died and the disciples were they were out fishing. They got frustrated, and they went fishing. And, and they were fishing, and Jesus comes up to the shore, and I think it was Peter looks out, and he realizes it's Jesus. And he, they had been fishing all night, and I think, hold on, the story, they, Jesus tells them to, they had fished all night. Jesus tells them, well, why don't you throw it over the other side? And they said, well, we've been fishing all night. And they do it anyways, and they end up getting such a big catch of fish that their boats were overflowing. And then Peter, I think it's Peter, realizes it was Jesus, and he just forsake, he lets go of all that fish, and he jumps to the shore to go follow Jesus. He just let it go, the biggest catch they probably ever had in their life, and he just dives in the water and goes to Jesus. And then I love this picture because as he gives his life fully to Jesus, as he jumps in the water, abandons what he had to follow Jesus, it wasn't long before the boats come to shore. And not only did he get Jesus, he got the fish. See, I'm not saying that you, you have to get a vow of poverty in your life and you can never drive a car and we have to go Amish, right? That's not what I'm saying. So let's go Amish, people. So we have wigs in the back and we'll take your cell phones when you leave. No, that's not what I'm saying. If you want to give me your cell phone, you can't. I'm just saying. But listen, 
But I am saying if you serve God with all of your life, you're going to find out that what you thought you really wanted was so insignificant that God's going to give you what you really wanted, and you're going to realize you have everything when you give God everything. See, what I mean is that if you sacrifice everything for God, when I was in high school and I started abandoning my old friends because I, I became a Christian and I knew I had to separate from the drinking and the partying and all of that scene. So I had to separate from my friends. And what I thought was the biggest thing I wanted, I was giving up, actually turned out was pretty insignificant because I ended up connecting closer with this girl who helped lead me to Christ. We became best, for, well, we started doing life together as Christians because we both left our friends, because we both gave up to follow Christ. We grew closer together, and now I'm married to my best friend. You see what I'm saying? As you serve God, he will bless you more than you could ever imagine. But it's in other ways than you think. But I want to tell you today, lay down your little vision. Don't follow the American dream. Don't follow the your dream, the Justin dream, the Amanda dream, whatever your name is. Don't follow that dream. Don't follow the Mercedes dream. <laughs> follow the dream that, that has God at the center. Has God at the center. What does the verse say in Matthew? Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first. Seek first. Not seek first yourself. Not seek first something else. Seek first the kingdom of God. And then what? And then all these other things will be added. But we flip it and we go, I'm going to seek these other things. I'm going to seek my job. I'll seek the career. I'll seek the car. I'll seek the wife, the husband. I'll seek that first. And if God fits in, that's fine. But it doesn't work that way. Christianity is all or nothing. It's either you realize that he died for you and he owe, you, you owe him your life. He saved you. He died for you. Or you're playing games. In church, you might have grown up in church. You might have grown up and it was just this little part of your life where, oh, yeah, yeah, you went about your day, you went about your work. And, oh, and then there's church on Sunday. Yeah, that's cool. And I, oh, yeah, I believe in God. It's just that little part. But you are missing out on the fullness of life that God has called you to live. And I got to be honest with you. There are millions of orphans out there that need homes. There are millions, 27 million estimated human traffic victims, traffic for sexual prostitution and things like that, and for human child labor. There are, there are millions of people who've never heard of God. There are wells, that there's villages with no wells and no water. There's all these injustices in the world. There's all these people who don't know God. And I just want to say, why don't they know? Because the church has failed to reach them. The church is the hope for humanity. And by church, I don't mean this building. I mean you. And I mean me. So the truth is, the reason there isn't more people being impacted by God and pulled out of human trafficking, and the reason, to be honest, is because the church has been playing games. And we've been shooting for targets that have us at the middle. But I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. If you would surrender your dream and you would pick up God's dream for your life, that we could see human trafficking abolished. We could see every orphan adopted. We could see every tongue find Jesus. We could see every person with the Bible. We could see every person with water and food. We could love every lonely person. We could see marriages restored. We could see miracles happen. We could see churches built, nations change, revival come. How? By laying down our selfish dreams, by laying down our selfish visions, and by picking up the cross and following Christ, and he will let you live a life of impact and fulfillment that he's called you to live. Yeah. Ephesians 2.10, you were created to do good works, which he pre prepared in advance for you to do. Church, my heart for you is that as you're going through work, as you're going through college, you would not get sucked into a life that has you at the middle and God just as a side note. But instead that you would realize that your life is meant to live for a purpose. You're created for destiny. You're created to do great things for the kingdom of God. But you have to surrender. 
your dream. And you have to pick up the God dream for your life. I love this, this next quote. It says, disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves. When our dreams have come true because we've dreamed too little. When we arrive safely because we sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord. When with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity. And in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. And it keeps going. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas, where storms will show your mastery. Where losing sight of land, we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizon of our hopes and to push us into the future in strength, courage, hope, and love. This we ask in the name of our captain, who is Jesus Christ. Isn't that good? Forgive us, Lord, when we've dreamed too little, when we've shot for dreams and visions that are just about ourselves, and yeah, they're close to shore, and that's great we arrived there. Forgive us for that, because number one, we're not reaching our potential. Number two, we're never going to know what it's like to fully trust Christ if we're not venturing out into the deep. And my prayer for us, church, is that today, figuratively speaking, as we're navigating along the shore following safe vision and safe dreams, that we would turn towards the seas. We would turn towards the dangers of following God with everything. You're going to have questions. You, you want to have all the answers. You're never going to. You want to have all the provision at first. You're never going to. You want to have exactly all the directions right away. You're never going to. What you want to do is set your sail towards the middle of the ocean where the waves are the roughest, but where the purpose is the greatest. And you just want to go and knowing that Christ will sustain you through all things. Yeah, you might get there if you serve a selfish vision. You might get there if you serve a little vision close to shore. But you'll never know what it's like when Christ rescues you and sustains you out in the middle of a storm. So yeah, I want you to go into dangerous waters. I want you to go out and, and risk your life to impact others. I want you to go out and risk your finances to give and be generous. I want you to risk your energy serving God. I want you to risk everything to cast off into the deep because that's where true purpose is found. That's where God has called every single one of us. That's where he's called every one of us. See, I want to say three things about picking up a God-sized vision. Number one, a God-sized vision will help you find the direction. It will help you find direction as you set your sights for that vision to serve Christ with everything in the horizon. You will find direction in your life. See, there was a study done at the Max Planck Institute of Cybernetics in Germany. And what they did is they took, I think it was eight people, and they, they, they put a GPS tracking system on them, and they either put them in a flat forest in, in Germany or in a desert somewhere. And their only instruction was to walk in a straight line. And in both cases, it was amazing. They, they started off well, and, and when they had the sun, they, they walked in a fairly straight direction. But then when cloud cover came over, they had no bearing on sight or vision or direction. And all of a sudden, as soon as the cloud came over, they started walking in circles. They went 90 degrees, then 90 degrees again. See, look at this picture. This is an actual picture of it. So one of them had the sun the whole way in the yellow, and he kind of veered off, but then fairly straight direction. But then the other two, you can see, they, the one of them was, I don't remember what the top one was, but the bottom was, was when all the cloud cover came over. And they had no bearing on direction, and look at, they were trying to walk in a straight line. But they just ended up walking in circles. Friends, that's what we do in our life. That's what we do in our life. We think, ah, oh, I'll serve God when it's easier. I'll serve God when it's better. And we go, I'm going to serve my vision. I'm going to go after my dreams. And as soon as we take our eyes off Christ, we start walking in circles in our life. We wonder why things aren't going well. We wonder why we don't feel fulfilled. We wonder 
because we're walking in circles. And I know so many people who I have these conversations with who are older, and they feel frustrated because they've been going round and round the same circles, the same mountain, trying to serve their vision, get ahead in the career world, make more money, get a nicer car, keep up with the Joneses. But they're walking in circles. So how did they walk in the straight line? It was only when they had sight of the sun. It was only when they had sight of the sun. Church, you will only walk straight when you have sight of the sun, Jesus. You will only walk straight when you forsake everything else and you walk after Jesus. When you walk after him alone, you will find that you found everything you've ever been looking for. You will find that you're not walking in circles anymore. You are walking in a line to fulfill your purpose and your calling on this earth. Lift your eyes into the hill. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord. When you lift up your eyes, fix your eyes, the Bible says, on the author and the finisher of our faith. Remember what we just said? Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. Otherwise, you will walk in circles. Pick up a God-sized vision for your life, church. Pick up a God-sized vision for your life. Also, when you have a God-sized vision, do you know that vision actually fuels passion? And passion is what fuels motivation and motive in our life that actually give us the momentum or the motivation to overcome things and to pursue a goal. I will promise you that you will encounter hardships in your life. Whether you pursue God or whether you don't pursue God, this life is full of obstacles. This life is full of giants. But just on a natural plane, when you pursue a goal that's worth something, that means something, any vision that means something, it fuels passion in your life. And passion and motivation is what fuels you in the hard times when you're down. It pushes you past to get through it to reach the dream and the vision. Okay, And so when you don't have a dream or a vision, you're actually operating on another side of your brain that when a hard time does come, you're not going to have the passion, the fuel, the motivation to overcome it. Check this out. This is from a guy who studies this from a book he wrote called Emotional Intelligence. He says, the word motivation shares its root with emotion. Both come from the Latin motir. Everyone say motir. Say it like real Latin, like motir. Here, you got to say that. Say mo with your, your accent. It's so good. <laughs> see that? You got to get some added motiri. Everybody say motiri. That's awesome. Where was I? I'm so lost right now. Where is it? There it is. To move. To move. Our motives. See, you don't know what it's like inside my head. It's out of control. Our motives give us our aims and the drive to achieve them. Listen to this. So listen to that. Our motives give us our aims and the drive to achieve them. Right prefrontal activation, the right side of your brain, activates and acts as what is called as a behavior inhibitor. People give up more easily when things get tough. They're also too risk averse, not smart risk averse, but overly cautious. They have low motivation. They're generally more anxious and fearful and have increased vigilance for threats. There's more, but don't turn it yet. So when you don't really have a vision or dreams, you're operating on the right prefrontal cortex of your brain. And it, it honestly, it doesn't, this guy's saying, when you act like that, you actually have behavior inhibitors in your life that actually stop you from overcoming obstacles. So number one, you're thinking you're following a dream or a vision, but it's not that great. And so it's not even firing on the left side of your brain, it's firing on the right, which isn't giving you the fuel, the passion, the motivation to overcome when hard times come. Okay, now let's go on. Davidson's research was found that the left hemisphere lights up even at the mere thought of achieving a meaningful goal. Someone say meaningful goal. Left prefrontal activity is also associated with something bigger than any single target. This is a sense of purpose in life, the grand goals that give our lives meaning. Isn't that cool? That's just a natural thing. But God created us. And I thought that was awesome talking about this because the truth is, as we serve selfish things, as we serve things that don't really matter, if it doesn't matter, it's not even lighting on the left side. It's lighting the right side, and then you're going to find that you will fall because you don't even have the motivation or the passion to overcome. But when 
I said, when you pick up a God-sized vision, you have such a passion because it is an all-consuming passion. And as you seek after it, it doesn't matter what comes your way because you are firing on the left side of your brain because you have the most incredible goal in the universe to fulfill your calling, to make a difference, to serve God. So it doesn't matter what comes your way. It's just like when David goes against Goliath. Man, that didn't stop him. Little David went up against a giant and slayed him without fear. Moses went before a Red Sea and parted it. Jesus went into a grave and broke it. Amen. You see, when you have a vision and dream for your life for God, it doesn't matter what gets in your way. It doesn't matter because not only do you have the natural motivation and passion, but when you're serving God, His Spirit is inside of you. The same Spirit that rose Christ from the dead lives inside of you. So if you're serving His vision, He's going to give you His power to overcome it. He's going to give you His wisdom, His, His resource, His power to fulfill the vision and dream in your life. Man, if that doesn't excite you, you need a cup of coffee right now because I'm telling you, this will change your life. This will change your life. This day is the day that your life changes. Someone say, this day, my life changes. Say, I will lay down my vision and pick up his vision. Church, let this be the day that you said, I'm done playing games. I'm done letting church just be a side note. I'm done letting God be a side note. But if he died for me, if he died for me, then he deserves my everything. And I will serve him with everything. I don't care what he's calling me to. I'm going to cast my bow of the ship into the deep. And I'm going to go to the hardest part of the sea to reach the people who need it and to serve God with my life. And I don't care what gets in my way. Sure, Goliath, come in my way. I'm going to throw a stone at you and get you down. Sure, Red Sea, get in my way. By the power of God, I'm going to part you. Whatever comes in your way when you're seeking after the God vision for your life, God will give you what you need to overcome it. The next, next point is this. A God-sized vision will cost you everything, and it's utterly impossible. How's that for good news? It's going to cost you everything. And on your own, it is impossible. And that's why many of us don't ever shoot for it. That's why we accept visions that are close. We accept visions that are easy to reach. We've counted the cost of those visions. Oh, that'll take five years of serving and then of serving at this corporation. And then maybe I'll get risen up or it's going to cost this in my life. But I want to tell you, if you decide today that you're done with your life, you're done with your way, and you want to pick up the God vision, it's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost your life. Not dying, but you know, you will someday. But It's going to cost you giving everything. It's going to cost you giving all your money, all your time, all your treasure. And what's more, you're going to realize that what you thought was important is you thought your time, you thought your money, you thought your gifts were meant for you, and you give them all for Christ, you're excited to do it. Are you kidding me? There's nothing more I'd rather do than use my gifts to serve God. There's nothing more I'd want to do than give all my money, give what I can to help people, spend and pour out my life for God. Having a God vision for your life will cost you everything. I heard a story one day about, I think it was the 1700s. There was a story of a guy who was, he had a plantation on this island, and there was two to 3,000 slaves on this plantation island. And he was a staunch atheist, and he said, I will not let anybody talk about God on this island. He even said, if a preacher shipwrecks near here, I will take him and I'll put him in another house by himself until someone comes and rescue him. But he's not going out there to my slaves and my people and telling them about God. So these two young Morovians heard about this. They were so moved with compassion that two to 3,000 people would never have the chance to hear about God or encounter God. That they literally sold themselves into lifetime servitude to this man. 
and they used the money to pay for their ship ride there. This wasn't like, oh, I'll go on a summer mission trip. This wasn't like, bye, mom and dad, I'll be gone for a year. This was like, bye, mom and dad, I'm giving my life so that these people might hear about God. And as they gathered together on the deck of the ship, as they gathered together where the ship was going to depart, friends and families, tears were going, and, and they were on the ship. Some were probably wondering, why would they do this? seems silly. And as they cast off, as the bow of the ship headed towards the unknown, as it headed towards the God vision for their life, the last thing that those friends and family ever heard them say was they yelled from the ship, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. May what God died for come to pass. May that my life might bring to others the reward of God, the reward of what he died for. Church, I pray that you would get this. I pray that that would be your heart. I pray that that would be your prayer. That as you set your life into the deep, that your mantra over your life would just be that may God be glorified. May the Lamb, may God, what Christ died for, may he receive the reward of what he died for. We hope you enjoyed this message from Risen Life. To find more, go to risenlife.net.